morning. It seems to me from as long as I can remember, but um, some of my fellow Vincentians would say, well, that goes back pretty far. But anyhow, uh, I've always been struck by the reality that we in the church celebrate this feast of transfiguration. And as it has happened through history, that this is also the day when the first atom bomb was dropped on the city of Hiroshima. Sitting in the chair there, I, I thought perhaps my recollection of that went back to when uh, I remember looking at the pictures in a big book my mother and father had gotten from the Inquirer with the front pages during World War II and reading those kinds of stories even before I was in grade school. Much can be said about the reality of August the 6th, 1945. But I think that we could all agree that certainly that was an event and the event a few days later involving Nagasaki, that it has cast a great shadow over all of our lives since that time. The realization of many countries in more recent years wanting to have that kind of, of power at their hand, other countries like our own, having begun with these, looking to further, in many ways perhaps to the detriment of the concerns for those in great need, those with nothing in the world. In truth, when you think about it, there's a great image there. We hear the word of the gospel, a bright light. We have two bright lights as we think about today, it seems to me. There is the great light, the transfiguration of Jesus, brighter than anyone could imagine. Other gospels, his clothes whiter than any bleach could ever make them. The transfiguration, this great light of Jesus, revealing the promise promise of hope and light and love. And then there's a, another light, the light, the explosion of the atom bomb, a light which in one way, certainly we could say, has brought great thoughts of darkness, despair, fear, and doubt. As we celebrate today, this Feast of Transfiguration, we are reminded that that light and that gospel story was a foreshadowing of the light that was to be made possible, yes, through the death, the passion and death of our Lord Jesus, but a light of hope, a light of promise that as we've heard the other readings reflected today, it's a light that can never go out it will never be extinguished. It can never be overshadowed as we find ourselves in the world. We have that foreshadowing of the great light of the triumph over sin and death by Jesus on the cross, that we might not fear, that we might never lose hope. We hear those wonderful words of Peter. I'm always struck. Peter always has something to say. Lord, it is good that we are here. It is good that we are here, that we are here to recall that story, to be with those three apostles there on that mountain, to realize the fact that as we do experience darkness that comes into our light, darkness in our own lives, the lives of those we love, shadows and doubt, uncertainties in the life of the church. That the end of the story was not darkness. The end of the story is not death. The apostles came to learn that. It took a little while as we journey through life there are times when we can kind of forget, but we're reminded as we celebrate this feast once again 
of what we share in the promise of our Lord. It is good then that we are here to be encouraged, to be reassured, to be comforted, to receive hope in the triumph of Jesus. The reality is that as we walk with him and as we respond to that voice from the sky, this is my beloved son, listen to him. As we strive to do that, that which can cause us to be troubled, that which can cause us perhaps to even possibly despair, we do not have to give ourselves over to that. It's for us to be encouraged and receive courage by what we celebrate, to receive encouragement by the word, by the Eucharist, by our support one another, particularly as we come together here. And that is to think of another light then. How wonderful it is that we are here, that we have joined together as we do in the Vena of the Miraculous Medal. How wonderful it is that we come together with Mary, look to her as our mother. In her motherly love, she wishes us to be filled with hope. It is wonderful that we share in a sign, an image that she gave to Catherine Labore, that we might know the ongoing presence of God's grace and concern for us, that in that image, the rays of light from her hands, speaking of the grace of God that is possible for us. How wonderful it is that in faith we continue to, to walk with Mary as she was there with her son and receive the light that even in that great pain that was hers at the foot of the cross, that light of faith and courage that she never lost and she wants us to know. It's important, it's great that we are here, it seems to me. I use that word courage once again. The courage that we need as people of faith to speak and to act in ways contrary to those that we hear in the world that say you have to look to your own security. We have to look out for those who are different from us. We have to have power to make sure that we will not be taken down. We as Christians, perhaps at times, even as we gather in a place like this, can be tempted to think that we need to withdraw from the world because of what seems so dangerous. And yet this feast reminds us, as Peter and James and John realized, you can't stay on the mountain. You have to go out to the world. They didn't know what all of what happened meant to them yet. And yet they followed, they listened. They dealt with their own limitations and weaknesses in living out the message of the gospel. And that brings us to where we are as we celebrate this feast to connect with that in a very real way as we continue our journey, as we promise perhaps we've made to people to keep them in our prayer, as we seek to give of our time just to be present to those who need to know that they're not alone, that the light of Christ is for them as well.